from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Deputy Director, I'm going to ask you leading questions. There are no trick questions. This is just my effort to go as quickly as we can. Anytime you have a hearing title that has the word preventable in it, um, I think we owe it to our fellow citizens uh, to discuss the limitations of our justice system. It is almost necessarily reactive. Something happens, law enforcement reacts to it. So for us to use the word preventable or to discuss preventing crime, of course we want to deter it. Of course we want to stop it before it happens. But our system was set up to be reactive. I want you and I to go back and start with the tip coming in so all of our fellow citizens can understand in theory what could have been done and then we can determine whether or not the result would have been different. The tip comes in and you first analyze it to determine whether or not there's a federal nexus, right? Yes, sir. All right, and that federal nexus could be the fact that there are persons prohibited from possessing firearms. Agreed? Yes, sir. Including persons who have been adjudicated uh, mentally ill and including uh, persons who are users of uh, controlled substances. There also could have been some other federal offense other than a firearm, uh, kidnapping, carjacking. So your analysts analyzed that tip from the standpoint, first and foremost, of whether or not there was a federal nexus. Correct, sir. All right. And well, he, sir, th sir, that's not necessarily correct. If there is not a federal nexus, yet there is an immediate threat to public safety, she would do oftentimes what was called a warm handoff or a warm transfer where the supervisor would sometimes directly call the state or local agency and say, hey, we got a problem here. You we're getting, to we're getting to that right now. The first analysis is whether or not there's federal, federal jurisdiction, whether or not there's a federal nexus for you to investigate. Correct. And if the answer to that is no, then you have uh, a, a, an obligation or have assumed an obligation to notify state and local law enforcement. And in this case, that was not done. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. All right, let's assume that it were done. Let's assume you called the sheriff or the police chief if it happened in a municipality. What, from a law enforcement perspective, can that sheriff or police chief do with the information your analysts received? So, sir, I don't know the state laws in Florida. Um, if you look through the call, there was a time when the caller stated that Mr. Cruz was suicidal and at that point or somewhere in that realm, during that realm, she actually engaged with the Parkland Police Department. I believe it was after that, I'd have to look at the call again, but after that where he became homicidal and he started to talk about killing others. What could the state or local department, what could Parkland Police have done? I don't know the options that are available to them. There are in many municipalities the option uh, to do a 72-hour hold. In this case, I don't know if that's an option, but they certainly could have gone out and conducted a welfare check. It, it, exactly. And, 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 and the good news is you don't have to be an expert in the law to know law enforcement can always go and talk to someone. Right. You can always go either do a field interview if the, if the subject is cooperative. You can show up at the house and do a knock and talk. That doesn't require any level of proof, right? You can knock on the door and say, uh, Mr. Cruz, do you mind if we talk to you for a while? Yes, sir. Again, I'm owning our problems and our mistakes. I, I, I know, did but when did we have a hearing that, title that has the word preventable in it, I think we owe it to the jury, to our fellow citizens, to let them know what law enforcement can and cannot do. So they can show up on the front porch and they can say, we'd like to talk to you. And he has the right to either talk or not talk. They can also say, we'd like consent to search, right? I, I mean, uh, you that is always an option to any law enforcement officer to right. request Right. It's that. great if you have probable calls and therefore have a warrant, but you don't have to have one to ask for consent, right? You do not, sir. And assuming you do that consent and you find a firearm, what would have happened then? I'm not sure. Again, you had an 18-year-old with no felonies on his record who purchased seven weapons. Had they found one, two, or seven, I'm not sure um, what the options would have been for them. You can notify the school district and make them aware that threats have been made, correct? Yes, sir. Was that done? Not to my knowledge. All right. So the, the, the theme that I keep seeing, is, and you correct me if I'm wrong, um, well, I don't want to overlook the cruelty to animals. In some states, including South Carolina, that's a felony. 
So had there been probable cause to believe that there had been acts of cruelty against animals, that could have been a way to at least put him in the system for some period of time awaiting bond before the crime took place, correct? Again, not knowing the laws of the state, I believe this was a rodent and or a frog. Um, I'm not sure how that factors in. All right, I'm out of time.